Hey, hey, everybody, it's Eddie from Tokyo. This is your cryptocurrency update from Japan. I have something big for you today. Ripple is going to integrate XRP on demand liquidity into their next generation trading platform. This highly strategic product for Ripple is powered by the superior speed, low transaction cost, and scalability of the digital asset XRP. And this position that they have listed lets everyone know that they are ready to hire the engineering manager. So they're ready for this person to lead and build out the team. Now, remember, Amazon started with just books. And the reason why I say that is because when I tweeted this out a couple of hours ago, I had a few responses that were a little surprising because people thought that maybe Ripple's leaving its core competency or this is a diversion or this is this is this is going to hurt their focus on what they're doing. No, not at all. Do you remember in September, Spring acquired logos? Spring, in case you are new to XRP and Ripple, they are a part of Ripple and they're focused on building the the XRP ecosystem. So the company Logos, they had an incredibly high caliber team. And as a part of Spring, they were going to explore the decentralized financial system that would leverage XRP. And they did so and have been doing so since September out of the office in New York City. And I think this is totally connected to that position as well as if I take you to the February 27 Ripple Drop episode 19 where David is talking about the ledger and how it's transformed and the changes have been drastic as he uses that word and in the early days you know they only really had the ability to transact uh, on the decentralized ledger in just a few seconds but now there are new features and so listen to this portion of the video changes that are in the form of new features one of the features that i think is is very exciting is a feature that would allow people to launch um well stable coins are the obvious use case but it's not just stable coins it's essentially assets pegged to some external value features similar to that exist on other systems but the interesting thing about this is that the liquidity is guaranteed by the ledger mechanics the liquidity is guaranteed by the ledger mechanics this is the tokenized assets that are on the ledger, and then XRP is the guaranteed liquidity. This, I think, is a very exciting project, and I am very much looking forward to it. So it is my opinion that this new engineering manager for the new trading platform is related to these two previous stories. Okay, let me take you to Mexico. This is, I think, nobody would argue, the most liquid XRP corridor right now. And Santander, the 16th largest bank in the world, they announced at the end of February that they had acquired a company called Elevon Mexico Holding. So Elevon is very, very big, but they took out that portion of the business located in Mexico, and they did that for $87 million. This was an application that they decided to acquire to create a global merchants payment business. And they believed that this would help them accelerate that business. So Alevon is interestingly the top five global payment providers in sectors like hospitality, healthcare, public retail, education. And I'm taking you to the site here that is, I think, very interesting because the company, Elevon itself, is owned by the fifth largest commercial bank in the United States, U.S. Bank. And you can see that in their alliance with Santander, they're going to actively work on a commercial offer that meets the needs of the market with technological innovation of products and processing services. You tell me why this wouldn't be XRP on-demand liquidity, especially since Santander invested $4 million in Ripple as a part of that $28 million Series A round of funding they received. 
So I think that big things are happening in Mexico. And is it a coincidence that the Daily Hoddle had the Santander and Ripple launching blockchain powered payment service in Mexico today? Remember, I don't believe in coincidences. Here is something a little different. This is Noble Prague. They do consul consultation, they do training, they do certification, and they have clients, one of which is Elevon, but also JP Morgan, the Mayo Clinic, Walmart, IBM, Intel, eBay, Toyota, Credit Suisse. Okay, enough name dropping, you get the picture. But they have a course catalog, and it includes courses in AI, big data, robotics, programming, game development, software, engineering, cloud computing, and yes, three courses in Ripple. Blockchain training specifically, and it is geared towards a uh, group of people who are either in the financial, in the financial, in uh, fintech area of businesses for developers and also for financial managers. It's instructor led courses, part lecture, part discussion, and it says heavy hands in practice. And in addition to these three courses, there is a course in XRP. And should you be interested, I'll put a link to it down in the description below. It is geared towards the financial managers and it can be completed in just seven hours. How cool is that? All right, there are some transaction numbers coming out of Japan in regards to XRP. And this is from GMO. GMO is an exchange and they show that the volume for transactions of XRP from December, uh, actually July to December 2019, you can see in the blue all months there, XRP by far dominates. So you can see how popular it is here. And they compared against the other altcoins of Litecoin, BCH, and Ethereum. And they're not even close. GMO, along with SBI, the two of them are going down to that new massive Bitcoin mining facility in Rockdale, Texas. And the reason why I bring that up is because it's really important right now for the stability that these two giants from Japan uh, are going. Uh, the Glassnodes Insights, they're a blockchain analysis company. They did this report uh, recently, and it is showing that a significant number of miners have left the space. They are removing their hash power, mostly because of the price. It's just not profitable. So this is causing some instability. And we don't want to see instability at all in the crypto space. And with Bitcoin especially, whether you agree or disagree with their their energy usage in mining, it is very important that because uh, everybody's still correlated to Bitcoin, basically, it's very important that Bitcoin be successful. So the cost of mining right now, and especially getting a little concerning after the halving, because miners, their estimated break-even cost is at $7,000 right now. And after the halving, it's going to go to twelve to $15,000. Now, according to James Todaro, he's the head of research at TradeBlock, he says he wouldn't be surprised if he saw the Bitcoin prices rise to these levels so that miners can remain profitable. But we just never know that, right? And so should they not be able to get the price up, uh, this is going to just cause more instability. And so I really like to see the larger, more, um, more equipped companies with lots of capital behind them, like SBI and GMO, that they do get into this space to bring some of that needed stability. Okay, I am um, going to tell you about one such miner that actually in the last 24 hours 
that we learned is uh, calling it quits. This is Digital Farms, and they are one of the business units of DPW Holdings, and they filed with the SEC that their operations have been suspended indefinitely, primarily due to the sharp decline in the market price. And DPW, a public company, uh, took two institutional investors' money, five million, to buy 1,000 mining rigs back in 2018. They bought S9s by Bitmain. And they also purchased a 617,000 square foot facility in Michigan to grow that business. And I searched because I, I really wanted to see what that looked like. And I could not find that location. I did come across something interesting, which is an abandoned gypsum mine just outside Grand Rapids. It's the currently the world's safest underground data center in the world, but it isn't what they bought because when I go to an SEC filing, I can see that it actually sits on a 34 acre site. It has 30,000 square feet of office space, 587,000 square feet of manufacturing space, a private rail, uh, security fencing. On premise is a natural gas system that powers generators and turbines. And it also has 18 acres of open field, which is noted in this filing that has the potential to install solar or wind generated power there as well. And I couldn't find, even with this, they're not giving us the location because they're calling it confidential and proprietary information. I'm sure if I looked, um, I'm pretty good at finding things like this, but I decided to just leave it and let it be a mystery for now. But I was most interested in what in the world this facility was before they acquired it. Well, in April, they're going to have their shareholders meeting. It's going to be held virtual because of the current global situation that we have uh, seemingly ongoing for a while longer. This meeting, they're going to have to explain a lot, like why did they choose to put their home office in some of the world's most expensive real estate? This is in Southern California. This is an address which is 201 Shipyard Way. It's in the gorgeous marina in Newport. It is just crazy to me that you decide to put your offices in a place like this and then you are spending other people's money and then it just, it just, yeah, it just kind of never ceases to amaze me how people spend other people's money. But they're also going to have to explain not only why they are going to continue keeping this office in the marina, but also why their stock is trading at 75 cents down from the 52 week high of $15. Yikes. I sure wouldn't want to be leading that call. Okay, everybody, we're jumping to some fluff. Yes, this is a picture from Tokyo today. We have um, snow all morning. We were blanketed in a beautiful, white, fluffy snow. And uh, it's just so beautiful because this weekend is the weekend for the full blossoms of cherry. And the cherry trees are looking so gorgeous. And when you see the cherry blossoms in the snow, it's like a oh, wow. I'm going to give you the keywords so that you can search on Twitter and view some of the photographs and also the videos that are uploaded. Here's one in slow motion. And it's just so beautiful. But what, in addition to all these beautiful photographs people are talking about, is also how haiku, the very short form of Japanese poetry, will be influenced with this occurrence. Because in the strict sense of haiku, the poem needs to have something seasonal. And to be talking about snow and cherry blossoms in the same poem 
is really going to be something. And in the five, seven, five syllable pattern, which mostly it falls, although it's getting flexible now, I think modern day poetry, the haiku is a little more flexible, but uh, in the traditional sense in Japanese, that's how the pattern is. Uh, it's, um, yeah, it's really fun. And I, you know, it's even, I can tell you that even the typical salary man will enter the um, contest that the office that he works at every year. It's just part of the culture. And there are so many, so many contests. Uh, and they are now opening up those contests to people all around the world. In fact, the, the big one, which is the Basho Awards, they had more than 35 countries participate with 1,275 submissions. But the one contest I want to talk about comes from a tea company. This is a maker called Itoen in, in Japan. And every year they hold a contest. And a couple of years ago, Gracie Starkey was the first non-Japanese winner. And she was just 14 years old at the time and from the UK. And her poem was chosen from more than 18,000 submissions. And then they print those winning poems on their labels for the year. And this is hers here, freshly grown, freshly mown grass, clinging to my shoes, my muddled thoughts. <laughs> How fun is that? All right, everybody do take care. Sayonara for now. Bye-bye.